Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. And we're going to finish the book of Joel today. Joel meaning Yahweh is God. There, there should never be any doubt about that. And this book that was written concerning Pentecost Day, the words that were spoken on Pentecost Day, in that language that was not unknown but was heard by the world. And there's, it is undated for a very special reason, that it only pertains to one date, and that's the Lord's Day. And the Lord's Day, of course, uh, it's important that you recognize that fact, or you're not going to understand this third chapter. Because the Lord's Day is a thousand-year period. Okay. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 and, uh, and, um, and 8 that uh, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years with man. And that Lord's Day is the day that God brings everything into balance. That is to say, everyone has an opportunity to know the truth when Satan's released at the end of the, that uh, thousand year period. And uh, then comes the great white throne judgment. Not until. <clears throat> so, you're going to have uh, one word that will date things in this chapter. I will call your attention to it as we arrive there. Chapter 3, verse 1, the great book of Joel, God is judge pertaining to the Lord's day. Okay, verse 1 reads, For behold, in those days and in that time, well, what time is that? When my sons and daughters begin to prophesy, when they're delivered up before the Antichrist, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, that's all tribes and the city itself, I'm going to take back over. So that also gives you a date. That's the seventh trump. That's the beginning of the Lord's day. Verse 2, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. In other words, those tribes were taken into captivity, the ten northern tribes by the Assyrian, which was a type, if you would, of even the false Messiah that would take people in if they listened to him. And then Judah later by Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, the Babylon of the great end times, people are taken in by deception. It's important that you know and understand what Jehoshaphat means and actually where it's located. Jehoshaphat, the valley, is really the valley that runs between, it is uh, uh, no doubt, between the Mount of Olives and the East Gate at the very temple itself the very valley through which Kedron runs. And you know, there's something you want to note, that that particular valley joins up with another little old valley just um, uh, pa a little past the city, and it's Hinnon. And Hinnon is the valley of where you have Gehenna, which is used by our Lord and Savior as hell, an example, a type of thereof. But what's important about this is the tense. Jehoshaphat translated means Yahweh hath judged. Okay. Or Yahweh judged. Now, when does he judge? There's only one time. It's the great white throne judgment. Well, when is that? The end of the millennium. End of the Lord's day. So you have to take into consideration that span of time or you're going to get lost, okay? So there you have it uh, in, the past ten, in the past tense that the Lord hath judged, and boy, is He going to, okay? He's not happy with what the way the world, the heathen, does His children. And there's a payday coming. 
a recompense, a day of vengeance. Verse 3, and they have cast lots for my people, I mean, okay, and have given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine <clears throat> that they might drink. They misused, abused, taken advantage of my people, overtaxation, uh, taking freedoms away from them, and consider them and considering them worth nothing, basically. Father doesn't like that. Okay. And you might say, well, when did all this happen? Well, wake up and smell the coffee, friend. Verse 4. Yea, and what have you to do with me, O Tyre, and Zidon, and all the coast of Palestine? Will you render me a recompense? And if you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? In other words, what, let's translate this properly. Let's just put it right down in plain old English. What God has said is Tyre, Tyre is the, the, Zidon is a little old fishing town that supplied the rock, um, Tyre, which was Satan's main point of operation. Okay. And, and um, much commerce and slavery took place from that place. Okay. And this is why uh, Satan himself is called the king of Tyrus, Tyrus meaning rock, okay, in the Hebrew tongue, um, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, where he's called, Satan is called the king of Tyre. But what, what God is saying here, what in the world have I done to you, Tyrus? What have I done to you that you would do this to me? And you think you're recompensing me. You're coming down on my head. You haven't seen anything yet compared to the way I'm going to come down on your head. Our Father's not happy about this. And Tyre and Zidon, which uh, basically makes up those that are against Ami, which is to say God's people, they better be paying attention. Our Father doesn't mess around. And he shall judge, and he judges correctly and accurately. And there he says in that fourth verse, What have I done to you that you're doing this to me? And you, th you think you're coming down on me? You think you're correcting God? You haven't seen anything until I come down on your head. Verse 5, Because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things, my desirable things. The very vessels in which um, uh, the temple was served were by communion, this sort of thing. You know, vessels that were dedicated to the use of the priesthood. And you can't help, when, when God says this, you can't help but know how it affected him when Nebuchadnezzar's grandson threw a big party in the very uh, house itself and asked and demanded when they were about three sheets in the wind, all of them drunk, to bring out the vessels from God's house. And they brought them out and began to drink out of them. It angered our father to the point that he had an in, a hand with nothing visible other than the hand itself, right many, many tickled euphrasian on the wall with no help or no assistance. And to know our father has a sense of humor, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson got so nervous and so excited, his knees quaked and his kidneys loosed and he wet his britches. Okay. And, and uh, because of fear. It's written. That's what the manuscripts say. Don't mess with God's instruments. Don't mess with those things that belong, belong in the temple of God for heathenistic practices. Our Father doesn't like it. Verse 6. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold unto the Grecians, Javans, that you might remove them far from their border. In other words, you sold the whole ten tribes taken by the, the um, the Assyrian, over the Caucasus Mountains, and scattering them out all over Europe, many of them migrating to Canada and the Americas, 
um, those ten tribes, God knows where they are. It's just that those people don't realize they're those tribes. And then Nebuchadnezzar himself later taking Judah and the other tribe, taking them captive. And so it was, and so it is. It is written, it is so. And our father, he says, when you scatter my children, of course, God himself said it would happen. And it's really kind of sad in a way that God would bring forth a people and give them the wherewith. And they always allow somebody to rook them out of it. That means to, to beat them out of it. And they dumbly follow along, yes, yes. And um, you might say, well, thank goodness that isn't happening today. Oh, no bailouts or anything of that nature, no socialism. Everything's just rosy and ducky, isn't it? You want to pay attention. Our Father doesn't like it. When people allow people to take advantage of them, and um, so... There they were removed, scattered, and the desolation still continues. Verse 7, Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither you have sold them and will return your recompense upon your own head. You've got it coming. Boy, are you going to get it. Uh, don't, don't worry. The evil do not get away with their shortcomings. God is keeping score. It's in the book. Verse 8, And I will send your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off, for the Lord has spoken it. And you know, uh, there's a beautiful thing about this um, Lord's Day. When, when you're a true Christian, when you're a true child of Almighty God, that you know that even those during that day, even the Sabaeans themselves, if they, they're children of God also, if, even if they have a change of heart at the teaching of God's election through that Lord's day and the Lord himself, then they can have a change of heart and stand against the false one and come into the fold of the houseship of Almighty God. That's the beauty of our Father, and that's the beauty of the Lord's day. But here we come right up to the wire, so to speak, of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Which do you choose? It's your ship, you're sailing it. You make your own choice. You make up your own mind. And you'd better pray that you've stuck with God's word, whereby you're not deceived. For deception is no excuse when God has sent you the letter of understanding and that you are taught on the Lord's day to understand all things if you have any, any um, wish at all to please your Father. Otherwise, you're out of here. Okay, Verse 9, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. That's the better translated than nations. All of them. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near, and let them come up. In other words, you bring on your very best. We're talking about here, in case you, we've moved all the way from judgment, the end of the Lord's day, all the way to just before the first of the Lord's day, to Armageddon and Heman Gog. Okay. What God is saying, you get together the best you got, the strongest you got. You put everything you got into it because I'm coming down on your head. And so it is written, Haman Gog being to our north and uh, Armageddon in Jerusalem itself. God will fight both those battles. He will not allow some army to. Because all the people that come against the unwalled cities, which is to say the free nations, Canada and America, from the north, the atheistic, communistic nation that come against us, that believe there is no God. And those that come at Jerusalem saying there is no God, God's going to show them there is a God, that his name is Yahweh. Joel, Yahweh is God. El, he is El. 
and they're not they're going to have an opportunity to learn it the hard way but yet at the same time if they learn a lesson because God will smite them and uh, we know that he's going to rain down hailstones weighing a talent. That's anywhere from 100 to 180 pounds. Now, I, I'm going to tell you what. A hailstone as big as a softball will destroy houses, cars, and, and even kill people. When you start dropping hailstones on an army that weigh 100 to 180 pounds, nothing, nothing can survive that. God makes such quick work out of them, it won't last five minutes when those armies are gathered to come against His children. God's wrath will rise and then so it will come. That day of Haman Gog and that day of Armageddon, and that happens in the last few minutes before the Lord's day actually begins. That's to say the seventh trump sounds and the Lord Jesus Christ Himself returns to this earth. And all, all are changed into spiritual bodies. Uh, even the Sabaeans. Uh, what I'm saying is God still loves His children, but God's going to correct them. There's not going to ever have to wonder again if there's a God because they're going to have Him face to face. And He's going to destroy those that would come against Him to prove one point in their mind, there is a God. And boy, is He angry at those that would belittle his children that try to do what is right. Our, our father is, um, when he says you bring on your best, I guarantee you it won't match or compare to the power of our father. And we continue then as we go with verse, the next verse, verse 9, verse 10. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. You bring on your best and even pump up those that do not. And you take every piece of metal or any instrument you've got and try to fix it into a weapon and you better be good because I'm going to take you out. Okay. Verse 11, assemble yourselves and come all ye heathen and gather yourselves together round about thither cause thy mighty ones Cause thy mighty, thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. The Lord's returning with an army that is going to just dissipate that that is evil upon this earth. Verse 12, let the heathen be weakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Yahweh hath judged. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Now we've moved again all the way to the, when, well, when is this judgment? the end of the millennium. This is why you've got to be sharp. You've got to know he's going from the beginning to the end. Hopefully, hopefully, and the purpose, the whole purpose of the Lord's day. You can read of it in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, that those that wake up in spiritual bodies and yet are spiritually dead, meaning they didn't overcome, they're very conscious, very awake. It's just that they still have a mortal soul. Mortal meaning liable to die so. Die where? In hell. Okay. When, when that day comes, then they're going to be taught, as it's written in that fifth verse, that God's election along with Christ will teach for a thousand year period. And hopefully when Satan is released at the end, a short season. And then there is another war of the heathen that come against the very city of God. But it's not the Haman, Gog, and Armageddon at the beginning. Uh, they will be wiped out. And then does the sea give up its dead and the world give up its dead? And Jehoshaphat, uh, God hath judged. It's already in the book from that, at that moment. And it will be no problem for our father to pass sentence as they pass under the rod. And you might say, well, where are you going to be? Well, it's according to what you're doing. It's according to what's in the book by your name. Okay. Have you paid attention? Have you tried to please God? Let me ask you a question. Have you forgot about the little ones? You see, this, this is the mistake that 95% of 
of ministries forget about. When Christ told uh, Peter, he's three times, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. They seem to forget about the lambs. They seem to forget about the little ones. That's to say people that are, are, are ignorant to God's word. They don't have time for them, or they don't teach in a way that a brand new listener can grab on to that truth and hang on to it. That's where your growth is in a ministry of truth, is through the lambs, not old salts that are retreads probably from somewhere else, it's in the lambs. You want to always remember that. It's a very humbling thing to know it isn't important how much you know. What is important is can, are you humble enough that you can go where that lamb is and bring that lamb up to where you are. That's the success of a ministry that has God's blessings feeding the sheep, feed the sheep, feed the lambs. And there you have the winning combination and that's, what, that's even what the millennium itself is about. Not butchering, not doing away with, which is ultimately what will happen, but saving, 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 saving. Uh, our Father has to get a little rough sometimes, and He will very much in this. As a matter of fact, it will destroy flesh, but spiritual bodies will come into being. Hear me out now. If it's... If you don't understand, put it on a shelf. It'll all fall in place. And then you have an opportunity to learn truth without sometimes some hang-ups in the flesh that might be hard to overcome. So our Father's coming down. And praise God for that. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 13. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come get ye down, for the press is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. It's, it's terrible. The wickedness of this world is, is a crying shame. It truly is. You could weep between the porch and the altar, knowing what happens in our, our cities today and elsewhere. But you see, men beat down an old woman while carrying a cross. That's, that's, God has something to say about that and will. I kind of want to see that. I kind of want to be a part of it. Uh, but that day is coming. And it's not, it's not that far away. Now, first of all, let me ask you something. Do you know what a sickle is? A sickle cuts a swath of grain. But we're talking about gathering grapes here with the sickle. That gets bloody, friend. I mean, you do not use a sickle to harvest grapes. So this is the sickle of judgment. And if you were to read Revelation chapter 14, verse 19, you would know that that same sickle put in to that wine press, gathering those grapes and splashing them and splattering them, that the blood came up to the horses' bridles for 600 furlongs. And God takes over. It'll sure get their attention. Verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. That's threshing, where that threshing takes place. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. It's here, beloved, it's coming. You can almost feel it. Uh, 15, the sun and the moon shall be darkened. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. Because of the presence of the Lord, his shining. 16. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. Where is the Lord? In heaven? No, Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. There is no other strength, beloved. God is in control. God sits on the throne still to this day. Satan is a has-been, basically, 
In other words, he, has, he only has the power that God allows to test the children. But um, there is, there's no other hope other than in our Heavenly Father. And that time is coming. I hope you can begin to catch on to the fact that he is in Jerusalem. He is on Mount Zion. He has taken up residence there. Well, when does he do that? Almighty God, the Son returns at the first day of the, of the millennium, the Lord's day. But Almighty God himself, Yahweh, does not return until the last day. So when he says he's in Jerusalem, you know that you're even past that time of decision and threshing. You're at the close of it. God's doing the threshing. 17. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion. Not maybe, not perhaps, but dwelling there. Okay. My holy mountain, not somebody else's, not Satan's, but belonging to Almighty God Himself. He waited in the 16th chapter of Ezekiel. He said, it's my home forever, eternity. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, not until. And there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. That, that means a zur, a foreigner. Why? There's not going to be any. They're either going to all be with God or they're going to be in the lake of fire. There's no, nothing that offends. Blot it out. Verse 18. I hope you can catch the tenses in this. Verse 18, and it shall come to pass in that day, not maybe, not perhaps, it shall come to pass in that day, that the mountain shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Chittim. And this, this, this is the Holy Spirit that runs from the very fountain, the throne of God, comes out and covers. You can read of it in the Millennium Temple, uh, verse, chapters of Ezekiel from chapter 40 to the end of that water that is the living water that comes from the very altar of God. And it makes a terrible stream soon that a man can't cross without God's permission. But there's food on both sides. Trees for food on both sides, meaning God still checks those borders and keeps them. But what a wonderful time that will be. A time of rejoicing. A time that you don't have to fear if you love our Father. If you know how He loves His children. My people, Father says, I me. Not low I me, not my people, but my people. God loves His children that love Him. That's what he wants from you. And if you want his blessings, you'll always remember that because that's what it takes. Verse 19, Egypt shall be a desolation and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah because they have shed innocent blood in their land. You know what? Do you know why that there'll be a desolation? I will add something to this. I won't add to it, but I will reason with you. There won't be any other um, uh, countries that we know of that have come against God's children. Why? He's going to destroy them. And there will be only one King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There will be no other. No other to... The, the ethnos will have their kings, but they are of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What a time to live. What a generation, this generation of the fig tree, to serve Almighty God in, in these end times. What a fantastic thing it is. Verse 20, but Judah shall dwell forever. How long was that? Forever. And Jerusalem from generation to generation. In other words, we move here after the judgment and after the removing of those things that offend. Forever and ever and ever. God's place being Mount Zion, that he looks forward to it. It is his. Verse 21 to complete the book. For I, this is emphatic, I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed. That's, I'm going to remove all guilt. Okay. 
Think about that a minute now. I'm going to remove all guilt. For the Lord dwelleth in Zion. Do you, you know what this word, um, do you know what this word dwelleth is in the Hebrew tongue? It's Shekin. Shekin. Have you ever heard of Shekinah glory? Uh, let me ask you another question. Do you know what Shekinah glory means? Shekinah glory means God dwells there. And it is wonderful that the same millennium chapters in the great book of Ezekiel, that the very final line in the book of Ezekiel is Yahweh Shema. Do you know what that means in the Hebrew tongue? It means Yahweh dwells there. You see, that's where heaven becomes. That's where the eternal heaven is. And heaven and earth shall rejoice. Well, well, where is heaven? Wherever God is. Well, where is God? He's going to be in Jerusalem on Mount Zion forever and ever and ever. And there will be no more zur, that is to say enemy. For if after absolutely 100 plus percent of learning truth and loving God, you fail, you're out of here. There's no room for you because there will never again after that point be anything that will come against God. God sees to that from the very tree of life itself that gives refreshment and provides leaves for healing as it is written in Revelation 22. That to translate it means that it can, you can never be bored or unhappy when you partake each month of those leaves for healing from the tree of life, which is to say, directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. Joel, Yahweh, is God and the Lord's day. We're approaching that time, beloved, and it's sometime, something you need to consider, to observe, and to know our Father means business. All right, I hope you enjoyed that book as much as I did teaching it. We'll pick up Amos in the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Ezra and Nehemiah, these two books are necessary to understand the returning to the Father in that sense of the example set forth in the end times of the rebuilding of God's most favorite place on earth. Also, within these two books, you find the hidden secret, hidden from most people's eyes, that the study in the Hebrew and the Chaldee that is given in these particular books will teach you how that the priesthood itself became polluted during this period of time. This is to say about 400 years before Christ walked the earth to the time that he did walk, instructing you very wisely, setting the example of how it is that we gather back to Christ himself. Ezra and Nehemiah, fantastic. You'll enjoy them. Now, ah, there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization, let's don't judge people. Father's the judge. You just teach the word as it's written. Never apologize for it. Let the chips fall where they may. Period. Okay. But our Father is so loving. But sometimes people need correction. Sometimes it has to come the hard way. But um, we, you have the right to decide for yourself, to discern spiritually, but let God do the judging. Those of you that listen by short wave, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. You got a prayer request? You don't need the phone number. You don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. You're his child. Father's on the throne and he knows exactly what's happening. And do you know something? Your name in the book, for every sin you've, not repented for, it's there. For every sin you've repented for, it's gone. It's not there. But all your good deeds are there. 
that's what he judges you for on that first day of the millennium to decide which side of that gulf you go to. Okay. So don't ever forget to tell him that you love him. All right, Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with uh, Stephen from, from Oklahoma. My question is, I know punctuation was absent from the Hebrew text as we know it. So why is Malachi chapter 4 verse 2, is it the S-U-N, son of righteousness? Is this a point of great significance perhaps question? It has always caught my eye as something that makes me curious. I normally am not. Well, well it, it should because it says a great deal. Who is the son of righteousness? Okay. And, and, and it has a play. What, it, what he wants you to do is to run the play to who is the light? Who is the light giver? And likening that to the sun that makes vegetation grow, that gives it life. You know, if, if no sun, no light, you, you plant a seed, you don't put a grow light there, it's kind of in bad shape. But he is our light. He is the word. And you can grow and you can produce by that son of righteousness, which even as he would follow in the next, next layer or a verse or so after that, that just before that great day, he would send Elijah's spirit, okay? And so it is before the true son of righteousness comes, the seventh trump, that is to say, the Lord Jesus Christ. George from California. A few years ago, I thought I heard... Um, you quote um, um, our Heavenly Father, my heart, my heart beats that's so hard in my chest that it feels like it might jump out. It was quoted to show the, the concern and passion our great God um, has for us. Uh, my problem is that recently my Bible group asked me for the chapter and verse and to my embarrassment, I could not find it. Please help me out. Did I hear Pastor Murray correctly, or is it a fogged over uh, memory? No, it's, it's not fogged over, but you, you probably heard the translation. The translation is, my bowels, my bowels, okay, which really should be translated, my heart, my heart. But why, why would he say this? Well, it's Jeremiah. Is Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 19. What happens in verse 18? Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 18. He says, my people are just a little bit sottish. I mean, they're a little bit on the stupid side. And they were kind of challenging him. And here's where he says, don't test me. If you think I won't do it, I destroyed every last thing off of this earth one time at the Katabo. When Satan rebelled, I destroyed every man, every, every individual, every city, every animal. I cleaned house. <clears throat> Don't think I won't do it again. And, and our, our father was very emotional at that point. But the heart does come. But take your strong concordance and you will find that where my bowels, my bowels, it, that it, it does can be translated heart, my heart, my heart. So you're on good, solid ground. As a matter of fact, he would say later in that same verse, my heart, again, okay, rather than bow. So you're, you're in good shape. You can hope that helps you out. Uh, Rachel from um, Mississippi. Um, thank you for opening my eyes to the Word of God. You are so welcome. In Hosea chapter 2, 22, what is the corn, wine, and the oil? Well, it's exactly that, okay? It, it, you know, the, the corn is, is what gives us um, uh, substance. Wine is even symbolic of the blood of Christ, and oil, of course, is the anointing oil of our people. Also, I read in the Bible about a vine which grew more than one kind of fruit on it, but I cannot find it again. What book and chapter is it in? I think you're thinking of Matthew chapter 7, verse 16, where it tells you how to identify a false prophet, okay? 
it says, you know, if you're a smart person, if, if you go along and you see a grapevine and it's got figs on it, somebody's pulling your leg, okay? Because grapes do not produce figs. Or I'll even, usually I add to that and say, if you find or oranges on an apple tree, you surely got to be smart enough to know somebody's joking with you, okay? So uh, it's God's way of saying, wake up. Don't, don't be such an easy pushover into deception, okay? If it's a grapevine, it's going to have grapes on it, not what some false prophet might come palandering along with all kinds of fairy tales. You don't listen to junk. That's what God is talking about, okay? Matthew chapter 7, verse uh, 16 will help you out on that. It's, it's several other places in, in the Word of God, almost in every gospel. Linda from Maine. Pastor Murray, my question is, will life go on as usual during our 1,000-year reign with the Lord? People living, dying, uh, doing wrong. There will be some doing wrong, but nobody will be dying, basically. The only time that people will be dying is when that army comes against the Lord's city in the last moment. Okay? Uh, you see, when you're in, bearing in mind that in the millennium all are in spiritual bodies, okay, and there is no dying as we think of dying of the flesh today, but then you have to remember Matthew chapter 10, verse uh, 20. Eight, fear not those that can kill this flesh body, but fear rather he who can cause your soul to perish. That means just blot you out, do away with you. That's our Heavenly Father, okay? Um, Stan and Shirley from California. <clears throat> In Revelation chapter 22, verse 14, it states that outside the gates of the new city are dogs, sorcerers, sexually immoral, and so forth. If God casts Satan and his followers into hell, what are these evil people doing here? Well, now, now you're missing something, okay? In Revelation 22, verse 8, haven't you, pay attention to it. What happened in verse 8 of chapter 22? Uh, um, John was taken all the way back to the year 95 A.D. on the Isle of Patmos. And, and there was an angel standing before him and he fell down and he started worshiping the angel and the angel said, get up from there, do not do that. Or, I'm a soul just like you are. In other words, the reason there was still dogs and everything around, he was taken back to 95 A.D. Uh, he was from the Lord's day all the way back to that time. In other words, he was returned to that time. And that's the point you missed, okay? But uh, that'll make it all right if you'll go back and pick it up there at the 8th verse. He came back from the Lord's day to 95 A.D. Um, Sheila and Madeline from uh, Newfoundland. Uh, in uh, Pastor Murray, is the four winds of Daniel chapter 7 blowing up on the earth today that brings in Satan's tribulation and the earthly kings, Cain's generation, Kenites, and our government today? My friends made, uh, may spoke of the four winds to her captain of her church, and he said he didn't know. Well, now go back, though, from, go from Daniel, go back to Revelation chapter 7, okay? And you will note there that the four winds are told to do what? And it reigns supreme. The four winds are told in the seventh chapter of Revelation, stop. Don't blow up on the people until we seal in the minds of the children those that must be sealed. That is to say, the teaching must continue until all the people that are supposed to have the real truth from God's word sealed in their forehead and then those four winds are going to blow. And that means the very end shall come. Okay? Uh, there's another place the four winds, I might just mention it comes to my mind, uh, is Ezekiel chapter 37. And do you know what chapter 37 is? That's the dry bones. And Ezekiel is told to do what? 
preach and prophesy to those dry bones. In other words, that's sealing them. You understand? And those bones begin to come on to bone and bone to bone and life came into them by what way? By preaching, by teaching. And finally, he said, what do you see? He says, I see a great valley out there. He said, within that valley is the whole house of Israel. And then the four winds are mentioned again. What a fantastic time to live in the time of the four winds. Yeah, we're there. Uh, Ruth from Kentucky. But it will be as God said in Revelation 7. Hold it until we get through with the teachings. Ruth from Kentucky. My pastor said you only use olive oil to cook with. I told him to read the book of James. Uh, we are supposed to anoint our body with olive oil and pray for healing. He said that's why we have doctors. I told him I've experienced healing many times by anointing with oil and praying. I want to ask him why he prays for sick people if he does not believe God will heal them. I don't want to argue with him, so how do I explain this better to him? I've studied with you for 11 years and I've learned so much. Well, Ruth, God bless you. Ruth, um, if, if this pastor is talking like this, you're casting your pearls before swine. And I'm not, I'm not insulting the man, but he needs to be. Don't you waste your precious truths upon that soul, okay? God's going to have to deal with him to get, get him out of that, okay? You're 100% right, but, you know, a pastor, you see, here, here's what many pastors are up against. If they were to teach other than what the hierarchy of their <clears throat> denomination or whatever expects, they lose their retirement. They lose their job. They're out. So you, you're, this is why it's very difficult to plant seeds of truth sometimes with, with brethren, but, and I'll leave it there. David from Kentucky. Pastor Murray, my question is, after we are in heaven, will we have free will? And will there be another angel as Satan did rise up against God and rebel and try to uh, take over again? No way. It will not be. This is the reason that the testing, as we covered today, Jehoshaphat, judgment, is so severe. Uh, it gets rid of all that offend. There will be absolutely no doubt that anyone that still would come against our Father at the end of the Lord's day needs to be dispatched, okay? By that I mean blotted out. We don't need them. And guess what? They will be. Uh, Terry from California. A question for Pastor Murray. My son is in the military. Will Satan control our armed forces? Thank you for all your dedicated service. You are so welcome, and I assure you, Satan will not control our armed forces. You know, we have many Christians in our armed forces. And this may, I mean, this may shock a lot of people. Hey, been there, done that. I know they're a tough bunch, tough a bunch of old buddies. But when it comes down to belief, you've got some strong believers there. They believe in God, they believe in our country, and they'll fight for it, okay? It's not that they want to stand up and die for our country, but they want to cause somebody that stands up against our country to die for theirs, okay? And they're good Christian men. Uh, basically overall. You might say, well, they live a pretty tough life to hear them talk. Eh, that goes along with the territory. Uh, they will do just quite si fine against Satan. Uh, Victoria from Arizona. Uh, Pastor Ronald Murray, I, I came to live in this country a few years ago. I believe this was not by accident. Our Lord brought me here for a reason. I married my husband and we studied the Word of God with you for almost five years, I give thanks to the Lord for His mercy to save me and using me, you to teach us the truth and how and to be prepared for the end time we are now in. My family and I was very close together before I came to the Lord, and I love my family for they were first in my life as we were raised that way. The family knows that we study with you, Pastor, and some of them say that we are being led down the wrong teaching 
of the word and that we will go to hell. I know this from our talks to, and how they feel. My problem is the love of them, for I am weak in the flesh. They feel that I have been closing the door to our home to them because of the teaching we have been learning from the chapel. They believe that I became a religious person. Well, not religious, a Christian, okay? That's a reality, not a religion. I feel insulted when I speak to them about how you teach the Word of God when I answer their questions. They don't understand that I want to live forever with the Lord. My question is this, it, it is, is it wise to allow some of my family to live in our house with us that don't believe as we do in these end times? My concern is that I don't want the contamination from the strong delusion that God will send. You, you don't have to worry about it, hon, okay? You, and, and family is family. You have, to, you have to love them. But if they are in your house and in your husband's house, uh, it is your home, your casa. And what goes down there is your business. And as long as they want to live under your roof or with you, then they have to abide by your conditions. I would not recommend, that in as much as you don't wish to argue with them, I wouldn't talk Bible to them if it upset them, you know. But if they are family and you want to help take care of them to get them a leg up, live that life and it sets an example that may rub off on them. But you and you alone must make that decision. But don't let somebody else take your house over. I'm not telling you to throw them out. I'm saying it's your casa. You run it. You're the boss. When it's your house, it's your house. Okay. Uh, Forrest from Kentucky, was Hosea's wife Gomer a physical whore or from a pagan family who worshiped idols? I respect your opinion and the great work you do for spreading God's truth, and we watch you at every opportunity on Dish Network. Well, thank you. Uh, she, you know, you, you have to realize, first of all, what does Gomer mean in the Hebrew tongue? It means full of idolatry and, and sin, okay? And what was happening? Israel was whoring after other gods, which would be translated idolatry. So God used this as an example. She was a harlot. Okay. He used it as an example of how his children, his wife, was doing him. God, even as it is written in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, God divorced Israel. Okay. Give her a bill of divorcement. Uh, and he takes that kind of stuff pretty serious, but you've got to understand the point he wants to make is not harlotry, but idolatry. That's the point, okay? And in, as how he named the children. Um, I, I know it's pretty tough, but that's, the, that's God made the point, and it stuck, right? Okay, uh, Joseph from Pennsylvania. My question is, would there be a reason God would want us to be alone? Uh, I was blessed with a loving wife and two beautiful children. Then out of the blue, she took them and left, and I had a really hard time dealing with this. Well, and I see that you're out of, out of work and out of a job. Well, you, you get out there and hustle, and you get you a job. Uh, if God gave you a family, he's not going to take them away from you, right, uh, intentionally. You may lose them, but he's not going to take them away from you. So I would highly recommend. Do you remember, do you remember how you courted your wife when y'all first met? How you loved her? And, and you say you miss your children. You, you get up early in the morning and you get out there and hustle. And you find you a job. And you start courting your wife again if she'll have you. Okay, if you, I'm saying if you miss your children and you love them. Okay. Um, and, and being alone does not uh, make it easier to serve God, okay? As a matter of fact, we are a family. The very temple of God is a multi-membered family, and it takes all of us to do God's work, okay? So, hey, um, a word to the wise is sufficient. Uh, Leela from California. 
The Bible says Satan claims to be the morning star, but in Revelation 22, 16 states that Christ is the bright and morning star. Well, honey, Satan always, that's why he calls, he's called Antichrist. He wants to be Christ because Christ is Christ. He, he wants, to, uh, that, uh, do you know what Lucifer means? It means bright morning star. He, he knows Christ is the morning star, so he says he is. He's a fake, a copyist, and he will always do that. Don't let that, don't, don't, be, don't marvel at it, okay? The point is, God wants you to be wise enough to know the difference between the morning stars, okay? Because that's knowing the difference between the true Christ and the false Christ. <clears throat> and a child can understand this because the false morning star comes at the sixth trump, and the real morning star comes at the seventh trump. Seven always comes after six. Remember that and you'll never be deceived. Wayne from Wisconsin. <clears throat> there have been a couple of stars in the evening about 5 p.m. sky in the, on the southwest. They have been putting on quite a show. Do you know what they are? I sure do. They are, and I'm out of time, but it's Jupiter and Venus and they're right by the moon making a, 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 a face. It's a smiley face on that side of the world and a frowny face on this side. So it just, just happens to be a coin. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. You know what? It makes His day because you're studying the letter that He sent to you personally for your edification, for, for your blessings. Let Him know that you love Him, won't you? That's what He wants. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, when you bless God, you know what he'll do? He'll always bless you. Most important though, you know what you gotta do? You stay in his word. Listen to me every day in his words. A good day, even with trouble. Why? Because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.